All right, today I'd like to talk a little bit about <clears throat> capitalism. Um, I don't want to spend um, too much time on the history, although I think the history of, of capitalism is a very interesting um, um, sort of sociological uh, um, phenomenon, um, kind of... Uh, um, a lot of debate about the origins of capitalism, how long it's been around. Um, generally speaking, I think the there is consensus that um, certainly no later than the 16th and 17th centuries, so the 1500s and the 1600s, we begin to see the emergence of capitalism um, as a feudalism and and uh, the the um, sort of the estate system of of Europe of the of the period from the fall of the Roman Empire uh, to the to the 1500s we begin to see a pretty significant a pretty significant decline in previous forms of economic organization and and the rise of something that that for the most part almost everybody recognizes universally as capitalism right a part of the problem of course is um, a, a function of definitions. So uh, there were economic systems prior to capitalism, like mercantilism, that a lot of people say are kind of a, a form of capitalism or sort of proto-capitalism. But um, other people say that because mercantilism occurs under other systems, um, um, independent of capitalism, it isn't really the same thing. And again, that's very high-minded. That's very uh, abstract and, and um a little bit outside of our outside of our scope. Um, what I would what I would like to to sort of put forward is that we we just sort of agree that um, capitalism, as we understand it in the twenty first century now, um, really begins to emerge and take shape in the fifteen hundreds and the sixteen hundreds. Um, even if there are some some um, economic systems that are kind of precursors to this, um, capitalism is an economic system uh, based on private ownership of prop property and one that is guided by a desire to seek the, the maximum amount of profit. And, and I want to kind of focus on that a little bit um, because that's a, um, kind of a really interesting and sort of radical, um, radical uh, way to understand an economy, right? So in the in the history of economic systems, so when you look, when you take a step back um, and you look at institutions, right? So these large structures that make up societies everywhere around the world, um, they're all built around addressing basic social needs. So every society has um, um, m many, if not most, of the of, of the same basic social needs going all the way back to the, the earliest societies. So for example, every society throughout history and everywhere in the world has needed to transfer skills and knowledge from one generation to the next. Um, and so they create um, um, cultural forms, they create structures and practices, they identify statuses and various roles that are associated with those statuses, all kind of built around the task of shifting information and skills from one generation who have those in those skills and that information to the next generation that does not, which then allows the subsequent generation to create new um, uh, types of knowledge and new skill sets um, because they don't have to go back and sort of rediscover the already existing sets, right? So the, 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 the transfer of skills and knowledge from one generation to another allows for social progress to occur. So that basic social need, what we call education, is, is something we find all the way back even in the earliest um, 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 human, human societies. So like hunting and gathering societies had a system for education. You didn't go to school, you didn't study for tests, there weren't, you know, it, it didn't take the form that education takes today in the 21st century in the United States. But um, word of mouth and experiential learning were very much part of how hunting and gathering societies were satisfying that that basic social need. So that's what an institution is, right? It's the set of arrangements and practices and ideas around how we're going to accomplish sort of basic fundamental social needs. 
So a basic fundamental social need has been how do we produce and how do we distribute socially necessary resources? Um, and we've done that different ways throughout uh, human history, right? In a hunting and gathering society, you hunted and you gathered. Things were distributed in a more or less egalitarian fashion, although uh, preference might be shown to like nursing mothers and for, to hunters because uh, those, those groups of people within these societies were um, um, responsible for, um, in the first case, um, the well-being of, of newly arrived uh, members of the society, and in the second case, the, 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 the food that the rest of the tribe was sort of dependent on. But a relatively flat uh, society with very little inequality um, right, because the economic system was basically hand to mouth. There wasn't a surplus. There wasn't a, an opportunity for, for inequalities to really emerge in any meaningful fashion. So, um, you know, that was followed by uh, pastoral and horticultural and agrarian societies, and, and that takes us up through, you know, like um, um, feudalism and other systems. So the, the history of human or the, the entirety of human history, um, there's kind of a through line where you can see the, the way in which the underlying economic system, whatever it is, is going to be critical to the other elements of that society, right? So other elements of society get organized around and reinforce the system of production and distribution. So the economy is this really central um, feature of, of society because it... it, it it literally is organized around um, producing the things that we need to survive. That's a very, very uh, fundamental and, and, and critical need. So, so capitalism comes along in the, in the 1500s. Um, and the purpose of economic activity under capitalism shifts, right? It shifts away from producing and distributing socially necessary resources to generating profit for people who invest capital, right? And a byproduct of that is the production of goods and services, and they are the goods and services that markets demand, but the purpose of capitalism is to generate profit for capitalists. The, the, the provision of goods and services is kind of a byproduct of that. And a lot of debate... Um, has raged over the, the, the roughly 500 years of capitalism um, um, about precisely how well it's done that. Um, and, and um, you know, capitalism itself has changed over those years as well. So, you know, the, the critiques of capitalism that people might have had of it in the, the 1600s um, are going to be markedly different than the kinds of critiques that are leveled against uh, industrial capitalism in the 1800s. Um, and of, um, you know, kind of information technology-based capitalism of, um, and transnational capitalism that we find in the 20th and now the 21st century. So if capitalism itself is evolving over time, um, even as people develop critiques uh, of it, and there are responses then to those critiques. So it's a really dynamic and, um, um, again, really, really interesting and... and, and um, I think in many ways an underappreciatedly radical, um, uh, underappreciated radical sort of system. Um, whether you like it or you dislike it, there's 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 a lot to be said for for just how dramatic a change um, capitalism is from from the previous systems. And, and 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 as I said, there's a really interesting history there. And I don't know how much of it you know it, it's worth it to kind of get into it. Although it's probably something we could talk about in class. Um, I do want to kind of point out some of the structural features of capitalism and talk a little bit about um, some of the um, some of the imperatives that um, that exist because of the structure of capitalism. Um, so maybe that's that's the best place to sort of focus um, um, time and energy. And, and 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 you know, I don't want this particular lecture to get too long um, because they're they're you know. The longer it goes on, the harder it is to sort of stay focused. So let's talk about pure capitalism, um, a kind of ideal model. Uh, the sociologist Max Weber used to talk about um, uh, a concept called an ideal type, which was kind of a, um, 
uh, a representation. Like if you, if you could take an idea and find its purest form, that would be its ideal type. Um, so for him, like the ideal type for formal rationality was bureaucracy, which is a kind of organizational theory that you apply uh, to to um, uh, to an organization with a with a, a task at hand. You divide up the labor. The relationships are uh, instrumental and department to department and formal community. Right. So um, you look at a you look at a bureaucratic structure, and it's kind of a, a perfect manifestation of um, of the ideas of formal rationality, right? So that's what that's what I, uh, Weber means when he talks about an ideal type. So when we think about capitalism, um, there's kind of a, a, a model of it that that doesn't really exist anywhere except kind of in principle. Um, but this this model was fairly close to what we saw um, in in the writings of people like. Um, Adam Smith, right? Adam Smith is a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, famously uh, known for for writing a book in in 1776 called *The Wealth of Nations*, in which he kind of um, um, dives into a kind of um, uh, philosophical and um, analytical exploration of, of 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 this economic system, which back in 1776 was still relatively new, uh, called capitalism, and. Um, you know the thing about Smith is he's kind of um, um, he's kind of interested in um, the philosophical side of it rather than the sociological side of it. Um, but but one of the things that he points out is that in capitalism there is a um, there is a form of economic um, activity that that essentially works because it appeals to the kind of people human beings are. So you know, a lot of philosophers of the of the Enlightenment assume that humanity uh, is made up of of organisms that are just inherently selfish. That was something that Durkheim believed. It's something that a lot of of, of other uh, Enlightenment philosophers, Hobbes and others uh, of his time, um, sort of embrace this notion that 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 human beings are sort of naturally disposed to being self interested and selfish. Um. And if that's true, <clears throat> and you know, there's a lot of debate, but if that's true, um, then an economic system that's predicated on everybody pursuing their own self-interest would be one that would be much more likely to work than one that sort of required us to alter, you know, what these people saw as human nature. So, so you know, um, Smith really likes this. Smith really likes this economic form quite a lot, and. Um, in the in the book, he kind of lays out sort of uh, some of its core features, and and um, I've sort of distilled them into um, um, four elements. Uh, first, um, private ownership of the means of production. Um, second, economic activity is motivated by profit seeking. Uh, three, competition and market forces determine price and production and all of those things. And fourth is the role of the state. Um, which is to have as little role as possible, uh, 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 um, what we call laissez-faire, which means um, let it be. Um, so I'm going to take each one of these in turn and just say a few things. So <clears throat> when we talk about private ownership of the means of production, um, what we mean is that the resources that we use to produce goods and services in a society are privately owned. They're not owned collectively by the society. Um, they're not owned um, by the crown or the you know the monarch um, or the authoritarian leader. They're owned by those resources are owned by private citizens. So um, um, you know agricultural products like wheat or cotton those are privately owned because they're grown on 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 land that's owned by private individuals either as an individual or a member of a family or a group or some shareholders, right? But it's all privately owned. So, so what we would call private sector uh, ownership of the relations or the means of production. The means of production is just, you know, raw materials, um, uh, labor power, um, machinery, land, buildings, right? All of those, 
Um, you know, when, when we talk about property, and, and this is true for both capitalism and socialism, right? So when we do economic analyses of, of, of these systems and we talk about property, we're not talking about all property, right? So, you know, one of the knocks on, on, on socialism is that there is no private property. Um, but that's not really true. What, what the property that is discussed in, in, in these kinds of economic analyses is what we call productive property. Um, so in a capitalist economy, private individuals, either as individuals or groups of individuals, own factories and raw materials and, you know, energy and buildings and machinery and all that. The toothbrush that comes off the end of an assembly line that you then subsequently stick in your mouth to brush your teeth, that's yours. You paid for it. You've used it. Nobody wants your toothbrush. Under socialism, nobody wants your toothbrush either, right? Once that toothbrush is in your hands, and especially after it's been in your mouth, it's yours. Nobody's coming to get it from you. Um, what's, what's publicly owned in socialism are the factories and the raw material, right? So it's really a... a private ownership of the relations of production versus public or shared ownership of the relations of production. That's, and it's that kind of property. It's not individual private property like your shoes or your toothbrush. That's a, that's a different kind of property. So, so when you, when you, when you hear people do economic analyses and they talk about property, um, if they are not being specific, you can, I think, reasonably assume that what they mean is, is things like factories and raw materials and uh, equipment and buildings and, and land and things like that. So private ownership of the relations of production. Um, if you own capital, you are a capitalist. That's what makes you a capitalist. You have control over capital. That's the, the capital is the word we use for pro, uh, pro, productive property. So uh, you own productive property, you are a capitalist. I'm going to keep this really simple, and I'm just going to talk about it in terms of money, um, uh, because that'll be the easiest way to sort of understand this. So if you have money, you are already rich. So capitalists don't engage in economic activity to get rich. They are already rich, right? What they want is to get richer, you add those two letters to the end of the word. That's really the thing that motivates them. They have capital because, you know, that's what they're going to invest to try to get more capital. Um, if you don't control capital, you're not a capitalist. You can become one, uh, but you aren't sort of one just because you believe in free enterprise and business. If you don't own productive property, um, you're pro-capitalism perhaps, but uh, you're going to have to go get some property. You're going to have to have some control over productive property before you kind of become a capitalist. So your motivation, um, right, your, your, your entire drive to take some of your capital and to go buy a factory and to buy machinery to put into that factory and buy raw materials and purchase labor power and energy and put all of that together to produce a product, you're risking your capital, right? You're, you're, you're taking money that you have and you're investing it in an enterprise that may not pay off, right? That's a risk. Um, so to incentivize your willingness to risk your capital, um, the deal is you're going to get to keep the profit that, that, that flows from that economic activity. That's, that's the thing that's going to shake your money loose and put it into something that will produce something that will ultimately benefit uh, society. But remember, you're not doing it to create something that'll benefit society. You're doing it to get that original investment back plus a little bit more, right? So, um, you know, the, the value that's being uh, kind of encouraged here is, is, is greed, acquisition. You want more than you currently have. Uh, and I'm not saying that in any kind of moralistic fashion. I'm not saying this is a condemnation. I'm saying it's an essential element. If you don't want more than you currently have, then you're not going to you're not going to invest. You're not going to engage in economic activity. You're just going to sit on on what you've got. So so you got private ownership of capital, which then gets um, um, put to work in, in 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 producing goods and services for the purposes of generating a profit. Now. 
this creates some really, really interesting dynamics, um, which I'm going to kind of unpack now when we talk a little bit about markets and, and competition and all of that, because that's kind of where um, it gets really, I think, um, um, really interesting. So if you, um, let me think about how to frame this. All right, so let's say you've decided that you're going to take some of your capital and you're going to invest it um, in a factory and you're trying to figure out what you want to make. What you want to make is what the market demands, right? So, so you as a capitalist, you can't really afford to, to engage in any kind of evaluation um, in a moral sense of, of, of what people, consumers, um, uh, demand. You just want to make sure you produce that thing. Um, we say that capitalism is an, is an amoral economic system. That, not immoral, but a, like the letter a, amoral. It means without morality, right? So there is no moral judgment. If the market demands shoes, but you think everybody should have hats, and so you make a bunch of hats, nobody's going to buy your hats, and you're going to have lost all of that money. And if you want to recoup that money, you're going to have to stop making hats and start making shoes, because that's what people want. You might think they're idiots for wanting shoes. Doesn't matter, right? That's what they want. So you, because you want to get a profit, you don't really care what they want. You just want to make sure you know what it is and you make it. Um, that's how this works, right? So markets say we want X. We don't have an infinite amount of money. We're going to prioritize uh, what we purchase uh, based on the things that we want or need the most. And so the capitalist kind of lines up and says, all right, how do I, how do I address that demand? So, so we talk about supply and demand in, in, in these marketplaces for, uh, you know, for, for products that are, that are being produced by, by capitalists. Um, demand for something drives prices up, right? So when people want something, they're willing to pay more for it. The price of that thing is going to go up. This is why it's, you know, this is why gasoline gets more expensive in the summer, it's because people drive more, right? If they drive more, they need more gasoline. There's more demand for gasoline. Prices are going to go up. When people are um, not driving very much, prices are going to go down, right? That's the that's the the way that demand affects the market. It's 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 kind of like an auction, and that's a really important thing to remember because a capitalist is really interested in making sure that they get their original investment back with a profit while risking as little capital as they need to, right? So there's a kind of risk aversion that, that happens here. And so if I'm making shoes because the market demands shoes, um, you might think that a capitalist wants to make as many shoes as they can. But remember, every pair of shoes that the capitalist produces is a sunk cost. They've put money into making those shoes and those shoes have not been sold yet. There's a chance they're not going to get that money back. So what capitalists want to do is they want to restrict the amount of something that they produce because if it's if it's a commodity that if it's a commodity or a service that people really want and there's a limited supply of it, that's going to make the price of it go up. So there's a natural inclination on the part of capitalists to produce as few of something as possible in the face of demand for that good or for that service so that the price of the good or the service goes up and they get their money back quicker with less financial risk. Now, what that means, of course, is that not everyone's going to get that good or that service, only the ones who can afford to pay for it. Um, the supply side of this is not going to come from an individual capitalist. It's going to come from competition. Right, so it isn't just me making shoes. It's this other guy over here who's also making shoes. Now, this other person's making shoes under the same set of economic conditions and for the same reason, right? So they don't want to overproduce either, um, and they want to recoup their investment as quickly as possible as well. But if my shoes are a hundred bucks, and this other person is producing shoes for roughly the same cost. Um, then all they have to do is offer their shoes for $99, right? And by undercutting my price, 
um, by a dollar, customers are going to gravitate to that product rather than my product, which means I have to drop my price. So there's an incentive for me to, to create a monopoly if I can, and if I can't, then I have to make sure that I'm minimizing the cost of production because now I'm in competition with other people who are going to be in a position uh, to sort of try to undercut my prices. So, so the, the, the presence of competition creates additional supply, which brings prices down. Limited competition um, um, allows capitalism to indulge in its natural tendency to produce as few of something as possible to increase its price and, and thus generate a quicker return on the investment. Now that's the logic of, of, of how markets work, right? That, that um, that's not a flaw, that's just the way the system works. Um, to keep monopolies from forming, you know, the state often has to step in. The state often has to come in and kind of generate uh, restrictions or rules or limitations on how actors in the economy can operate. If I use my early entry into uh, a sector of the economy to create some dominance where I control the relationship with the suppliers of, say, for example, raw materials, I can't use that leverage to squeeze out competition um, because, again, that's that's antithetical to the interest of capital, but it's also completely consistent with me pursuing my own rational self-interest. So the idea here is that that if the government's role is to take as little responsibility as possible, um, you can see a kind of obvious contradiction, right? That 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 government really needs to step in, and it's not a coincidence that one of the first elements of of this kind of pure capitalism to sort of disappear as capitalism becomes a, a dominant economic system is that is that sort of um, let it be laissez-faire role of the state. Government becomes uh, pretty engaged and active in um, um, maintaining the conditions under which capitalist production can occur, but also making sure that the, 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 the tendencies of, of, of um, capitalists in this, in, this, in this kind of competition um, don't lead to the formation of, of monopoly. So uh, a, a kind of an interesting tension there. There's also a couple of, there are also a couple of other interesting um, um, dynamics that kind of come out of this. So for example, uh, the role of labor in all of this, right? Part of, part of what happens is that capitalism maximizes its profit by reducing the cost of labor. Um, you know, you, you can create a, on the margins, right? You can create a little bit of buzz for a specific product for which people might pay a little bit of a premium. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at kind of the, the, the um, um, not every product in the market is a niche product by definition, right? Some products are just, you know, mainstream, um, you know, kind of bread and butter items. So the way that, the way that one particular, um, um, you know, pair of shoes or, um, um, you know, butter knives or um, um, dinner plates um, becomes more, um, more profitable for the, the capitalist that's producing them is they're paying their labor force less to produce them. So this is why we get um, uh, this kind of um, pursuit of the lowest cost for labor. Um, there's a kind of a pressure in capitalism to always find the le least expensive form of labor uh, that's available. Um, so, you know, you see um, a reliance on, um, say, for example, slavery in, in colonial holdings and in like the British American colonies. Um, um, it's not to say that slavery is inevitable under capitalism, but it represents a, a kind of, um, a, you know, a real windfall for capitalists if they're in a system where they can um, have labor that they don't need to pay for. Whew, that's fantastic, especially in very labor-intensive um, operations like agricultural operations in the, in the 1600s and 1700s in the British American colonies. Very, very labor-intensive to grow rice or, or tobacco or, or especially cotton. Um, but it's okay because you're not paying your workers anything, right? You're just, you know, kidnapping them from, from, um, Western Africa and bringing them, you know, to, to the Americas. So, um, labor, 
right? Which again, your labor is is something that you own. It's 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 um, you know it's it's your capital, I suppose. Although it, it it doesn't make sense to think about it like again, I don't want to confuse anybody too much. Don't think of labor as capital, but think of it as a thing that you own that you can kind of um, um, deploy. Um, you know, to, 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 to address your interests. Um, and this is what Smith writes about, right? So, so the worker sells their labor power to a capitalist, not because they want the capitalist to do well, uh, but because they want a wage. And then they're going to take that wage and they're going to go buy things, right? So they're doing this for selfish reasons. Um, the capitalist is deploying capital to produce commodities and services that the market demands, not because they care about the commodities and the services that the market demands, but because it's going to generate a profit for them. And of course, the market doesn't care about the well-being of capitalists. They just want the products and services that they would like to buy. And so Smith talks about how everybody kind of pursuing their own rational, selfish uh, desires is going to lead to a system that produces a benefit for everybody. Now, I think that's a little bit of an overstatement. There are people who are going to come out uh, as winners and losers because, as we'll see in a, in a, in a minute or two, not everybody's on the same playing field. Um, not everybody's in the same position of advantage relative to, to others. Um, But again, his argument is, Smith's argument is that, that the system in which everybody's kind of pursuing their own self-interest is going to produce an outcome in which workers get a wage, which they can then use to support themselves. Capitalists generate a profit, which gets them a return on their investment plus a little bit of extra. And the market gets the goods and the services uh, that they want. And, and it is as if guided by an invisible hand. And if you've ever heard the, the expression, the invisible hand of the marketplace, that's that's where this language comes from. It, we're all being guided as if by an invisible hand. We get an outcome that is desirable with relatively little in, intervention from, you know, um, the government, from the state, um, because you just basically let everybody pursue their own rational self-interest. Now, some of the limitations of this, of course, um, some of the tensions and the contradictions are that capitalists are always going to try to um, externalize a lot of the costs that are associated with their with the production of their goods and services. So pollution, for example, um, the cost of pollution is not embedded in the product that the marketplace is, is, is buying. Um, but it is a cost of production that ought to be in there. But what happens instead, of course, is that the smoke goes up through the smokestacks and it goes out into the world and it becomes a problem for everybody and everybody pitches in, usually through taxes, uh, to clean it up or people um, suffer the consequences of living in, in environments that are degraded by pollution. Uh, so there's a cost of production that's not actually embedded in the price of a good or a service. Um, there are other kinds of negative externalities. That's what we call those things, right? Negative externalities are basically just the side effects of an activity that negatively affect others. Um, but to the extent possible, capitalism will always find a way to take those negative externalities and push them out into the world without actually having to capture the cost of them in the cost of the product or the service. Um, there are systemic imperatives. There are, there are structural conditions uh, that constrain the actors in, in an economic system um, that end up promoting the status quo. And we're going to talk about some of those as we get a little bit um, um, further along in the semester. But, but um, again, you know, the, um, um, the, the, the bias is toward uh, the current way of doing things because people are kind of invested in, 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 in that current model. You can see this in the climate debate. Um, we, we know that to, to avert the worst possible consequences of anthropomorphic climate change, um, we have to get away from a fossil fuel-based economy. We also have to scale back consumption. We have to change um, social organization at almost every level. We have to rethink the way that we live and where we live, all of those things. The problem is people are deeply invested in the way things are right now. And um, you, know, you can kind of see that. If we close a coal mine, because coal is a dirty, polluting fuel, if we close a coal mine, what happens to all those coal miners? 
who need that job to be able to, you know, feed their family and provide, um, you know, shelter and clothing and all of those other things, right? That's a cost, and and some someone's going to have to make up that cost. Um, but you know, we can't just turn those people loose into the into the cold. Um, and so because of that, it's really, really hard to get people to commit to closing the coal mine. Um, even though we all agree, um, if we're being if we're being candid and honest, we all agree that that coal mine's got to close because we got we can't keep doing this, right? The long term consequences are obviously bad, but the short term costs are high enough that it dissuades us from from taking those risks, right? And so there's a kind of inertia in the system that's a what we would call a, a systemic imperative. It's just a you know a kind of what's good for GM is good for America kind of thinking. Um, and, and so again, we'll talk about the degree to which social problems in the economy kind of flow from that, but that's something to kind of keep in mind that capitalism itself is kind of, um, um, rife with tensions, um, and, and, and contradictions. Um, Marx writes about this in his critique of capitalism in the 1800s when he talks about kind of the, the dialectic process through which capitalism is being transformed as it tries to resolve its own contradictions. So if capital needs to reduce the cost of labor to maximize profit, what, what's also happening, of course, is that capital is depriving consumers of the wages they would use to purchase goods and services. So I need to pay my workers as much as I can pay them so they can buy my products. I also have to pay them as little as possible so I can maximize my profit. And that contradiction, that tension is something that capitalists need to resolve and the way that they often resolve it um, is, is, is in a way that favors short-term returns on investment, even if it comes uh, at long-term cost. Another, uh, uh, another structural sort of feature of capitalism that gets underappreciated is the way in which capitalism requires unemployment, right? So if, if the supply of labor, because remember, everything, there's a market for everything. If the market for labor is such that the supply is zero, right? So everybody who wants a job, let's, let's imagine the scenario, right? Everybody who wants a job has a job, right? Full employment. Everybody's employed. Along comes Bob over here. He wants to he wants to take some of his capital. He wants to start a business. One of the things he needs to purchase is labor power. Where is he going to find his workers? They're all already working. So the way that he's going to get somebody who works for Tim over here to come and work for him is to pay that guy more than what Tim is paying him. Tim's going to turn around and say, I don't want to lose that worker because I need him uh, to to continue to be profitable. So there's going to be a bidding war. There's going to be an auction for the price of labor. And since there's no additional supply of labor in the system, right, because everybody who wants a job has a job, then the price is going to go up. And there's nothing to help bring it down. There's demand, but no supply. Um, so capitalism in order to control the cost of labor, capitalism needs what Marx used to call a reserve army of labor, right? A pool of people who want to work and who can work, but have to be sort of kept on the sidelines in order to help control the cost of labor. Now, again, that might not be the worst thing in the world, but the problem is when people aren't working, they're not making a wage. If they're not making a wage, where are they going to get their money for food, clothing, shelter, medicine, all of those other things? So capitalism requires unemployment, okay, but capitalism then also has to set up a system of social welfare because capitalism can't afford to have those people die because if they die, the supply of labor goes back to zero. So one of the weird sort of twisted ironies is that capitalism requires not only unemployment, but also social welfare, which is at odds with this whole notion of, of kind of a laissez-faire role uh, for the state. And so, you know, again, it's a it's a... It's a it's a kind of cumbersome and, and and clunky sort of economic system that does a really, really, really good job of producing a massive surplus of products, but a relatively mediocre track record of getting them equitably distributed to the people who need them. And that's, um, um, again, one of those many social problems that we're going to look at in, um, in in the coming weeks is the problem of inequality, um, which again, flows from a system 
that is organized not to produce um, resources that can be equitably distributed within the society, but rather to produce profit for the for the people who are risking capital to produce those goods and services. Um, so you'll see that there's kind of a, um, a really, really interesting uh, set of upsides, but also some very, very serious and problematic limitations to capitalism as a system. And I want, for our purposes, right, I want you guys to understand um, that the system produces tensions, that the system produces inequality, that the, produ the system operates on a, on a kind of a, um, a power differential between capital and labor. Um, you know, capital has to buy labor power in order to produce goods and services. So, you know, a capitalist has to hire workers to do the work. Um, but they don't have to hire you specifically, right? Um, and in fact, there are going to be a lot of people and you know, maybe including you, who won't get hired because, again, not everyone can have a job under capitalism. Um, on the other hand, you have to sell your labor power. You don't have to sell it to that capitalist, but you do have to sell your labor power. You can sell it to whomever you want. If you don't like the conditions under which your labor power is being purchased, which is a really fancy academic way of saying if your job sucks, Right. I mean, that's the way you frame it. Right. If you're if you're if the conditions under which your labor power are being purchased are not agreeable to you, then you can sell your labor power to someone else. It's yours. It's your labor power. It belongs to you. You can sell it to whomever is willing to purchase it. Um, you can quit a job every day of the week for a year. Um, right. Because your labor power belongs to you. But at the end of the day, if you don't sell your labor power, you don't have money. And if you don't have money, you don't have food. And if you don't have food, you die. All right. So you can see capitalists are in a little bit more of an advent and an, an advantaged position relative to labor. No mistake, capital needs labor, but they don't necessarily need my labor or your labor. They just they need some labor. Um, on the other hand, you and I, we have to sell our labor power because that's the only way we're going to get a wage. And the wage is what's going to allow us to continue to, to, to live. So there are all kinds of interesting um, sort of, um, um, you know, I don't know what you call them, tensions, contradictions, um, hidden sort of imperatives in, in the structure and logic of capitalism, which... Um, which I think are really interesting to explore and 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 to consider the implications of, and and that's one of the things we'll be doing uh, over the next couple of weeks. So um, until then, I'll say good night.